Hello and welcome to another uh, video. Uh, so we'll go through some of the topics that we talked about in class. And so this one will be focusing on the notes, talking about the population growth models and how populations are uh, changing as they um, as they grow from and influence from different environmental factors. Okay, so as we go through the uh, population models, it's important to understand exactly what we mean when we talk about different populations. So remember from earlier that a group of one species uh, is our population, and that a population can have what we think as a geographical range. And these are all the different habitats, all the different areas in the um, ecosystem or across different environments and different biomes, different areas of the earth, uh, that we could find that particular population of that species. And then the number of individuals that are inside that overall um, geographical range, that would be considered the density, so the population density. And really, there's three ways that a population will disperse or spread its density over the geographical range. We get a random, which basically means normally single individuals um, that have no real pattern because they're kind of distributed or, or released into the environment. Uh, based on a whole bunch of random factors. So this would be things like lots of different types of flowers. The individual flowering plants um, are kind of released in random areas around a field, or uh, perhaps spiders as well. Spiders are normally solitary um, uh, organisms. They don't normally live in large groups. Uh, they don't really interact with each other very much. And so their placements around an environment uh, can seem relatively random because there's various factors that are deciding where they end up. Next, we could have a uniform. Typically with uniform, everything is very evenly spread across its habitat. Uh, there's a very specific space that they, uh, they miss to maintain before they, uh, you, they interact with the next member of their own population. Uh, and so they will kind of uh, have this uniform spacing between them. And so you can think of pine trees as you walk through a forest, for example. Pine trees are normally following a, a very specific uh, limitation on space between them. And schools of fish as well. If you've ever seen schools of fish swimming through an, an aquarium or something, or maybe scuba diving, um, they have a very specific uniform distribution as they're moving as a group. And the last thing would be uh, aggregated or clumped. And this is referring to kind of a, a random placement, but then in, in small groups. So it's very similar to random, but instead of individuals, we're now talking about groups. And actually, most organisms on Earth will follow this aggregated or clumped pattern. Um, human beings do it, uh, fungi, animals like uh, elephants and uh, lions and uh, gazelles and zebras and giraffes, uh, horses. So um, uh, a lot of things that you're probably thinking of actually end up following the, the clumped uh, form. And this mostly comes down to the idea uh, because they need a source of nutrition and so they're going to have to kind of move around from place to place and so it's actually safer to be grouped together in a larger group rather than to be uh, an individual just by themselves and so that's why the clumped is such a popular uh, model for species. Now we want to think about why a population grows over time. We have to think about the various factors that are contributing to its change in growth. So mostly this would be coming down to a few things. First off, there would be what we call the age structure. So uh, how many males and females, and uh, how, what's their average age? If there are more females in a population versus males, typically that means the population will grow a lot faster than if there is a small group of females and a bunch of more males. If there are a bunch of young individuals in a population, normally the population will increase very quickly over time because all of those young individuals are going to start reproducing as they get older. If there's a bunch of older individuals, uh, normally that population is going to decrease very quickly because those older individuals are, might end up dying because of their older age. Uh, and so depending on males and females and their average ages uh, would have a big influence on the, the uh, growth rate of a population. Now, numerically, if we want to really think about growth rate, we would also think of the birth rate which is the number of uh, newborns that are born every year versus the death rate, which would be how many individuals end up dying within a year. And then immigration versus emigration. So immigration would be members from an, another population coming into the area and emigration would be members in that same uh, area leaving for a different population, leaving for a different uh, possible habitat or something. So typically when we think about the uh, growth rate, we can think of this equation of the birth rate minus the death rate, 
plus the immigration rate minus the immigration rate. So the positive minus the negative change, and then we compare these two values together. Uh, and uh, that will tell us kind of how we can measure uh, population changing over time. Now, once we start measuring the collecting data on a population over different periods of time, uh, and we were to graph that data out, uh, typically we, we find that the population will go through what we call a sigmoid growth pattern. And so basically through a sigmoid growth pattern is we have four distinct phases of growth. We have the lag phase, the exponential phase, which you can also call the log phase, which we have right here, right, log phase, the stationary phase, and then a death phase. Now, the first two phases, the lag and log phase, sometimes we say that is the J-growth phase, uh, or the J-growth time, because uh, they kind of create a J-shape if we we're to graph it out. And so that J-growth is the lag phase plus the log phase. Now, during the lag phase, typically, population is going to grow very, very slow, and that's mostly because there's a very, start, a very low number of starting individuals, so the population itself is very, very small. So even though everyone in the population might be doing reproduction and everyone is succeeding and being able to reproduce and to have children, because there are so few members at the very beginning, the population doesn't actually grow that quickly at the start. Uh, so basically we would say the birth rate is very, very slow, but it will be increasing as time goes on. Eventually though, we hit a, a nexus point or a turning point where the exponential phase will kind of kick in. And with the exponential phase is typically we see a rapid doubling uh, of the population. So very, very rapid growth, and in fact, doubling of the growth. And that's why we say that it is exponential because it starts doubling every time we go through a reproductive phase. This means that the birth rate is gonna be significantly higher than the death rate, and that's why the population is growing so quickly. Now, when you think about the exponential phase, you have to understand why it is growing so quickly. And the whole reason why it's able to reproduce so quickly or why the population is able to have so many successful reproductions or have a very, very high birth rate and a very low death rate comparatively normally comes down to the idea that there aren't any limiting factors. And so limiting factors are uh, biotic and abiotic parts of the environment that are going to slow down or inhibit the population from growing. So this could include uh, the amount of space, the amount of food, the amount of water, uh, how much competition there is, whether there's predators in the area, how many mates there are. There's lots of different types of limiting factors depending on the situation. But if there are no limiting factors, that means that the reproduction can be occurring as fast as possible. And that's why we're getting this doubling of the population over time <coughs> that we see with our exponential growth phase. Now, the exponential growth phase can't continue on forever because eventually we will start to run out of certain material. There will always be some type of limiting factor for growth. So we will start to enter what is our, our S-shape part of our growth. And so this comes from the idea of adding the other two phases, our stationary phase and our death phase. And so the stationary phase is essentially where, because the sources are becoming limited, because of those limiting factors, the birth rate is gonna to start to slow down a lot. And so then eventually the birth rate and the death rate are gonna be about equal. So for every so many babies that are born, so many older individuals are going to end up dying. And so the change in population isn't going to be uh, very much at all. There could still continue to be some growth, but that growth is gonna be extremely slow, much slower than even when we saw it with our lag phase. Okay, and that's mostly what happens is because the population has hit what we call the carrying capacity or the maximum number of people or individuals or members of that population that can be in that population at that time based on those limiting factors, based on the biotic and abiotic factors of the environment. Once we go above the carrying capacity, which happens most of the time, is that that's when we hit our death phase. And during the death phase, as you can probably think, the population goes uh, and drops very, very quickly because it's gone above the carrying capacity, so now there are not enough resources to actually keep everything alive. And so the death rate is going to be uh, much, much higher than the birth rate, and so we see a sudden drop in the population. And sometimes you can even refer to this as what we would call a negative growth. 
So it's important to remember that you understand that the carrying capacity is basically the, the maximum number of individuals that the environment can support, but it's always at that specific time and under very specific conditions. So carrying capacities can shift. We could change the carrying capacity or the environment could go through a change that causes the carrying capacity to increase or to decrease. So if it increases, we could see the population re-enter into a second exponential growth phase because the limiting factor is gone. If the carrying capacity is lowered, there could be a very sudden quick death phase because the population is so much higher than what the carrying capacity could be. But basically at any point, if the population overshoots the carrying capacity because the limiting factors start affecting the population even stronger than before, that's ultimately what is causing the death phase. So the population starts decreasing very, very quickly. So normally what will happen in a population, as you can see here, is we will have our lag into our log as in a stationary as we go towards our carrying capacity. And then we will fluctuate around the carrying capacity, repeating the cycle over and over again, just in smaller increments. So we will go through another lag phase, another exponential phase, another stationary phase, and then another death phase. And so over and over again, this, these four cycles are going to be repeated uh, as they go through the different phases, as, the, as we hover around our carrying capacity. Now, you might be wondering if all species then are able to hit their carrying capacity, and the answer to that is no. It really depends on their life history plan. Not every animal is capable of, or every species is capable of hitting a carrying capacity in their environment, because it really depends on whether or not they live a very short life or a very, very long life that would prevent them from ever actually hitting this carrying capacity. So there are actually two different extremes that we have in terms of a life history plan. We have what we call a rapid life. So here we have our mayfly, which is a insect that will only live for um, one day, basically. It will be born, uh, it will hit its sexual maturity within a day, uh, it will then go off and reproduce, and then it will die shortly after reproducing. And so it has a very, very, very short lifespan of a single day. Versus something like a tortoise, or uh, large um, um, Galapagos turtles. They can live for 100, 150 years, uh, but they have extremely slow lives and they reproduce very rarely and they normally have uh, very, very long developments before they end up reproducing again. So since they have such a long life history, it's unlikely they would ever hit the hit carrying capacity because there's a good chance that the ones that um, were born, you know, years before, decades before, they're also going to die at some point. So the young individuals that are growing, they're not really having to worry about competition with the older ones above them. So if we have an extremely short, rap or what we call a rapid life history, or a very long life history, normally carrying capacity isn't going to be an issue. So if we have something that has a rapid history, normally you're thinking mostly of insects. They have a uh, very small body size that will grow very quickly. They will reproduce very, very quickly after they are born and therefore they have a really short lifespan, and so they never really hit their carrying capacity. A lifespan of a single day, not really gonna be an issue. Versus our sea turtles, right? Being a slow life organism, they reproduce and grow extremely slowly because they have this very, very long lifespan. And so normally they maintain their population size at or near the carrying capacity, but they don't normally go over the carrying capacity unless there's been some kind of major shift in the environment. Again, because it takes so long for their population to increase, uh, there's a good chance that the individuals that are older are going to die anyways um, before the uh, younger ones even start doing their own reproduction. So. 150 years versus one day, those two extreme ideas rarely ever go at their carrying capacity or even over their carrying capacity. However, in between that, if you have a, a mixture between a, a rapid and a slow life history plan, like most animals that you're thinking of, um, they will have to deal with their carrying capacity and will fluctuate between growth periods and death periods, depending on the carrying capacity and the environmental factors. So we spent all this time talking about limiting factors, and now we want to conclude by talking about very specific categories for how we think about what a limiting factor is. And so remember, a limiting factor basically is any part of the environment, biotic or abiotic, doesn't matter, that is going to be basically limiting the size that the population can grow to. So this can be food, predators, space, water, anything it can be biotic or abiotic by itself. And there's essentially two types that occur. We could think of density-dependent ones, which 
means that if we increase or decrease the size of the population, the effect of the limiting factor also increases or decreases. So if we increase the population's size, the effect of the limiting factor gets stronger. If we decrease the population size, the effect of the limiting factor gets weaker. The other one would be the density independent factors. And these would be ones that it doesn't matter if the population is big or, fall or small, the effect is exactly the same. It's equal strength if it's a small population or a large population. Now to get into some examples of what we mean when we say density dependent factor, right? So the first one would be competition. Competition obviously gets worse if we increase the number of individuals in a population. I told you guys to imagine uh, at ACS in the cafeteria, imagine if we just doubled the number of uh, ninth and 10th graders that had to get food at, at this, during the same lunch period. The amount of competition, the amount of stress that you guys would be under as you're trying to get food uh, would be significantly higher than if we cut the number of individuals at ACS in half, right? So the population in the number of individuals in that population has a huge effect on how strong the competition is going to be, influence everyone. So basically more members means that more food and more water is going to be required. So that everyone's going to be starting fighting over whatever limited food and water that is around. Typically, this ends up with killing off of weaker individuals and actually becomes a major aspect of evolution, whether or not a population is going to change over time based on the ones that are able to survive or able to deal with this uh, competition. Then we have things like predation. So typically, when we're looking at predator and prey interactions, the population size of the predator and the preys uh, will be influencing each other. So here, if we think about a lynx versus a hare, so here we represent the uh, hare in red, and so we have the population is very low. And so as the population starts to increase, all right, we see here correspondingly in response to that, the population of the lynx also starts to increase. But now the population of the lynx is so high, it's now having an effect on the hare. So the hare's population is starting to decrease. But as the hare population decreases, the lynx population is also decreasing. So if we increase the number of predators, well, that's not so great because that means there's, they're going to be eating more prey. So the prey's population goes down. But the prey population goes down, there's none of the food for the predators. So then the predator population goes down. If the predator population goes down, that's, not so, that's good for the prey. So then the prey population goes back up again. And so normally we see a continuous fluctuation going up and down and up and down between the predators and the prey. So predation, obviously predator prey numbers will be greatly affecting each other. So that would be a density dependent factor. Overcrowding is another issue, of course. The more population, the more individuals in a population you have, the more overcrowding that can occur. This increases stress, which weakens the immune system and increases uh, the chances of fighting and also it's going to make competition worse, right? So the things are kind of connected to each other there. And then that also leads into disease. Uh, the more individuals we have in a population, the worse disease can have an effect on that population because it's much easier for it to spread between the individuals if they are all crammed together in the same area. And again, because that's going to affect their immune system, they're more likely to spread the disease, get affected by the disease, and potentially die. So these are just some of the density dependent ones. And now let's look at the independent ones. So now we think about independent factors, right? Independent factors or density independent factors would be things that, again, that they, they do are not concerned with if it's a big population or a small population. The overall effect is exactly the same. So, for example, we might have weather patterns. Uh, let's say that we have really, really bad flooding and it ruins a food supply, right? It, it's too bad for that food supply, but we're not going to ruin more food or less food based on the population in the area. It's going to affect everything in the area exactly the same. Uh, for example, maybe we have a drought and a bunch of water ends up uh, running out. We run out of fresh water. Again, the drought's strength is not going to be dependent on the population that is affecting. The drought strength is going to be consistent regardless if it's a big population or a small population. Uh, we could see a reduction in the amount of time for hunting or for reproducing, again, because of some changes or weather uh, and, or the climate. And then, of course, natural disasters. Massive, massive lowering of population numbers can occur when there's an earthquake or a volcano or a hurricane or a tsunami or even a, uh, an, um, an asteroid hitting the Earth, right? These are all natural disasters. 
And the strength of these natural disasters has very little to do at all with whether or not it's a big population or a small population. Uh, they could lead to a major change in the ecosystem, and they might even end up removing a very important food supply. So the last thing to think about is how does this all relate to our human population as well? So humans uh, used to have a very, very high birth rate, but also a, a very, very high death rate. And so we were in, even though we had maybe some pretty high numbers compared to other species, uh, we were in a relatively consistent lag phase. And then uh, around uh, the beginning between 1000 AC and 2000 AC, right around here, let me get that pen here, right around here, we have our nexus point. And that is our point where we take off and we, uh, we start to have exponential growth and we hit our exponential phase. And you look here at that crazy exponential phase, how much growth, doubling of population size that we've been experiencing. So currently the death rate, or so the birth rate is about five or 4.3 births per second. And the death rate is only about 1.7 deaths per second. So our birth rate is significantly higher than our death rate. And so we are expected to see a lot more births occurring than deaths. And so our population should continue to grow in size. So currently, or well, not currently, because this might be a little outdated, uh, the global population is predicted to, to double about every 46 years. And it used to be more than that. I think at one point it was over 90 years, and then it was 150 years. So the amount of time that we're expecting the population to double is getting smaller and smaller uh, as we go through time. And so we are definitely in an exponential phase. At some point, we have to worry about are we going to hit some extremely strong limiting factors that are going to cause us to enter into a stationary phase or perhaps even worse into a death phase if we've gone really really far over the carrying capacity and we're not even aware of it yet so we're definitely in our j growth because the doubling time has gotten shorter and shorter and so basically what has lowered our death rate but allowed our birth rate to be so high these would be things like having more food, all right? So we removed the idea of food as a limiting factor from our environment. We reduced the amount of deaths that would happen by increasing medicine or the supply of medicine. We've decreased the amount of childbirth death. So we've limited those, or we've reduced those factors and their effects on our death rate. And then we've therefore increased the lifespan by having a longer lifespan, but also continuing to be fairly uh, consistent reproducers uh, we've had a dramatic effect all over the earth with increasing the uh, birth and death rate. Okay, so hopefully this was pretty clear. And if you have any questions, you can ask me and just make sure to use this in your notes and your revision packet and everything to help prepare for your tests.